Hello and welcome to Diaspora Network Television, DNT. Uh, we are in one of those uh, virtual interviews. Um, I wish I had these ladies in the studio, but uh, we have to do a virtual these days. Everybody's running help to scale to everywhere. Uh, I'm delighted to be joined by two amazing young women who may not be a household name uh, back in Ghana, but if you have any idea what they are doing uh, for Mother Ghana on the other side of the Atlantic, uh, you would soon appreciate them. So let me introduce um, Ajua Chermatin. Which one of Hi. these? Ajua, hello. Ajua hello. is president and CEO um, of... Uh, Ghana Diaspora Public Affairs Collective, and then uh, have Kim Afwakwa. Hello, uh, Head of Government Affairs. These two are the power ladies in Washington, DC. And so we're going to speak to them to find out what they're up to. It is very, very simple. And me, I'm here in my little corner in Sugarland, Texas. Ladies, welcome. Thank you. We're here in Martha's Vineyard. Oh, okay. Actually, Martha's Vineyard. All right. That's uh, which state is that? Is that New York or Rhode Island? Massachusetts. Massachusetts. Okay. Very good. Very good. All right. Uh, self introduction. I've I've told them your name, but who are you? Start with you, um, Madame Chermating. Okay. Hi. Uh, so Adwa Chermating, President CEO of. What many people say now, Ghana Diaspora Pack, GH Pack, we have so many monikers because I guess many people don't want to just say Ghana Diaspora Public Affairs Collective. It's just a simple name. Mm -hmm. But okay. <laughs> but yes, yeah, so it, normally we are in Washington, D.C. Um, that is where I work and live. Uh, with my husband and child and uh, have been involved in politics and policy for almost 20 years now. Um, actually, there's a couple of ways in which people get into this kind of career, but uh, my track was through PR. I started off as a reporter, then ended up working um, as a director of communications for a congresswoman, uh, and when I was on the hill, uh, Capitol Hill, um, that's when I really fell in love with policy making and government affairs. Um, when I left Capitol Hill, I went to what we call K Street, which is another moniker for uh, lobbying, um, working primarily on healthcare issues. Um, and then along the way, obviously, as a proud Ghanaian American, um, start to stick my nose into any affairs related to Africa and Ghana, and uh, ultimately gathered a few others that had that same passion, and we started Ghana Diaspora Pack. Okay, very good, thank you. Now next, uh, Madame Afwaka, tell us about yourself. Well, thank you again so much for having us today. Um, I grew up in Silver Spring, Maryland. I currently reside in Bowie, Maryland with my husband and three young children. And similar to Adjuas, from a young age, I've always had an interest in politics and policy. And so uh, I studied at Howard University. I was a political science major. And then from there, I went on to law school at the university of Baltimore. And I had several internships during that time. Um, I spent a semester at the Department of Justice on Capitol Hill interning for my home state Senator Benjamin Cardin um, while he served on the Judiciary Committee. And then I had an exciting uh, internship experience at the White House serving as an intern for First Lady Michelle Obama. And that really just shaped my interest in public policy and the intersection with government and how all of that impacts legislative affairs. Um, but my whole life, my parents um, have been involved in the Asante Kotoko Association. So we used to go to all of the events, they would take us to all of the meetings. And so even though I was born in the US, I've always had that passion for Ghana because what was instilled 
in me. And so actually my late father, Michael Kojo Dunfor, and my father-in-law, um, Francis Aquasia Sumanina Fuakwa, he was actually the former president of Asante Kotoko before he passed. And so that has just carried with me all my life. And I was introduced to Ajwa by a mutual friend and she shared with me her vision for GH Pack. And ever since there, we have we've worked together to fulfill um, the mission of the organization. Very good. So you were born in uh, in the United States. I draw, where were you born? I was also, you know, it's so funny. I tend to fool people sometimes. <laughs> but I was also born in the United States. And just as Kim has shared, from an early on, had mm -hmm. a, a love and dedication to Ghana, what was happening at home. I credit that to my parents. But when I was young, um, I, I went to live in Ghana um, for a few years as a young child and came back. And then every summer I would go to Ghana um, with my family. And then when I was really young, I also started the Ghana Friends Club. <laughs> In middle both, school. Both, you know, and both of you I, ladies have what they call baby face with your cheeks and everything. Yeah. So in yeah. Ghana, I guess we'll call you Dada Bas, right? But Oh, uh, yes. I, I learned that term pretty early, actually. <laughs> okay. I decided to embrace it. You got it. You got it. All right. When you hear about Ghana or GH PAC in Washington. Mm -hmm. When you hear PAC, P A C, it usually stands for Political Action Committee. But right. yours, I just noticed that it means Public Affairs Collective. What 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 does it do? What's the relevance of it? So PAC in this case actually has a double meaning because Ghana Diaspora Public Affairs Collective mm -hmm. also has a put a political arm mm -hmm. called the Ghana Diaspora Political Action Committee. Okay. Um, and then we have our charitable arm, the Forward Ever Collective Foundation. Okay. So here in the United States, as you can imagine, it's very important to have your legal designations intact and in order, in order to be able to effectively uh, execute on activities. So the collective mm -hmm. is our uh, 501c4, which means that we can lobby uh, we can lobby and advocate on policy issues impacting Ghanaians living in the United States and uh, U.S. Ghana uh, issues. Um, oh. We also do policy work, uh, meaning we research, mm -hmm. we um, educate uh, on our various stakeholders on these issues, and then we write letters or we impact uh, government officials on these issues. For an oh, example, mm -hmm. um, we wrote a comment letter to the Department of Homeland Security um, when under Trump, under the Trump administration, when they were considering a pretty harmful proposal to put Ghana on the terrorist state, uh, sorry, terrorist country list because oh, wow. of overstayed international student visas. Can you imagine? Because of what? overstayed visas with international students. So they wanted well, to talk. Uh, wait, if you're a, a, um, a, an international student from Ghana and you overstayed in America, Trump was Trump administration was going to dub you a terrorist. Not the student, the country. So meaning. Oh, well, yes. Oh, yes. Yeah. They, they were going to dub the country Ghana a terrorist country because her citizens have overstayed their visa in America. Yes, they were going to put Ghana on a watch list. And so we uh, wrote a very long letter. We had to do research. So what people don't understand is that lobbying is not just um, shaking hands and, you know, all that. It is also making the argument. Okay. So we um, presented research that showed there was no basis for the policy proposal. Mm -hmm. Um that uh, the, what these were what these international students were doing, you know, that this is what they had accomplished. Um, this was the important role that Ghana plays as a U.S. strategic ally, and so that there was no basis for the proposal. And in the end, the, the, did we win that battle? 
yes, the proposal did not go forward. Very good. So let me get with you, uh, uh, Madam uh, uh, Farquhar. Madam, okay. Um, what are some of your policy accomplishments besides the one that was just uh, announced, which I believe is huge? A lot of people in Ghana do not know this. But what else have you guys done since the inception of your organization? I think one of the most valuable things that we've done is making sure that members of Congress, policymakers, um, advocates are aware of GHPAC and that we are a resource here in this country and we have a presence with many of our members across the globe. So being, so we want to make sure that um, we're a resource. When there's questions, sometimes you know, policymakers will come up with ideas without checking in with the right people to make sure, does this make sense? Are we messaging it well? And that's something that I think is a real, um, that's really important for any organization. A new one like ours, fairly new, that's establishing ourselves, especially in the Washington, D.C. Um, hub of politics and policy. Um, so I think that's huge. And bringing people along to support uh, the work that we're doing. You know, we have commented on, on legislation. We, during the pandemic, um, we really work towards making sure that members of the community are aware of the benefits that they're entitled to. So you think about unemployment insurance and how during the pandemic, typically, if you're an independent contractor, you wouldn't be entitled to unemployment insurance, right? But you think about the cab drivers, the gig economy, a lot of them didn't know, but we work towards ensuring those communities um, really understood like, hey, you can get a piece of this pie and you're entitled to it. And so that helped a lot of people during a very, very challenging time. Um, we, during the um, census count, we were involved with that. We uh, went to various churches to make sure that our people, hey, you're counted and you understand why being counted as part of the census is critical. It is the vehicle that helps determine how much funding, aid, and resources go back to your community. Another area, um, and it's along the lines of our uh, PAC, is supporting Ghanaian Americans, Ghanaians who are running for elected office in the state, uh, local, state, and federal level, um, knowing that they have someone that's here to support them, to uplift their names and support their candidacies. Because as we know, being a part of the election process is very critical. Your vote is important. You want your voice to be heard. And it's good to have someone um, who's representing your interests at the table. So I would say those are the three areas where we have really accomplished a lot um, the short time since we've uh, been launched, been an official organization. You know, if I... as, as a self-confessed uh, political animal, a policy analyst, I can't overstate what you guys are doing. But the begging question is, shouldn't there, it, it, aren't these the, the stuff that our embassies are supposed to be doing? And I'll add to that question, how closely I, I, do they reach out to you? Uh, we we enjoy a very close relationship with the Ghana Embassy in Washington D.C. Actually, and the new ambassador, Ambassador Mama, has been wonderful, wonderful okay. um, in her support and her staff. However, um, the em embassy is charged to represent the Republic of Ghana and government. We at GHPAC are charged to represent Ghanaians no matter where we live. And that is the starkest difference. And that is what we tell policymakers as well, that uh, we are here to advocate on issues impacting Ghanaians no matter where we live, even if, even if that means that the government of Ghana is part of the challenge that we have to address, or the government of the United States is part of the challenge that we have to address. And so it's very important for um, people to have to participate in the civic uh, process. Um, and, you know, the, what is somewhat of a, a um, unfamiliar term of lobbying uh, in the Ghanaian community, it can be familiar in the sense of when we think of pressure groups back at home, when we think of 
when we get on a radio to um, give light to issues or when when we strike um, because of issues. This way, our, one of our taglines is to advocate collectively, which means to bring all the important stakeholders together, including Ghanaian community leaders and getting them engaged in this process in a way that protects them. Because many of the our Ghanaian community leaders have, are heads of 501c3s or are church leaders and cannot be explicitly involved in the political process. GHPAC is, uh, provides the ability for Ghanaian community leaders to be heard in a way that doesn't harm their um, status. You know it what? Also, <laughs> Go ahead. Go ahead, finish up. It also allows uh, uh, for us to give voice to the undocumented. One okay. of the things that we do work on is um, stopping deportations. Uh, and one thing that people don't know, Ghanaians don't know, is that uh, your congressional representative can stop your deportation and it is part of their duty to hear out your case. We seem to think that because some of us are undocumented, that, that means we don't have rights and a say here in the United States, and that's not true. You're here, you're paying taxes, you're working, and so we also work on those issues, and we hope to very soon launch our pro bono um, immigration legal program, who we, we hope to work with multiple partners on that. Okay. One other thing I, I'd just like to quickly add is just to underscore what Ajwa mentioned is the importance of stakeholder engagement. I mean, it's critical. You know, oftentimes when our lawmakers are making decision, decisions, they take into consideration the business community and then the stakeholders, right? That's who they go to to get information, to check the pulse of the community. Um, and we want to make sure that our voices are heard on in issues, especially those that impact us. We don't want things as Ghanaians to just happen to us. No, we want to be influential and say, this is what's important to our community. These are our needs. And then just as a side, you think about some of the communities they have community recreation centers. They're able to get funding for special initiatives and projects where they're highly, they're densely populated in certain communities. And it's like, well, we ha our numbers are equal in this part of the country. Why don't we have a community center? Or why didn't we have, you know, healthcare centers coming to administer vaccination shots for our, our people at our church and things like that? But if we're not a part of the table, they won't just think about us, right? Exactly. So GPAC is also using... Um, our power and our voice to ensure that we, as taxpaying citizens, we as people in this country that contribute to all sectors from business to healthcare, that we're that our people are getting a slice of the pie. So not just oh you're a lawyer, you're a doctor, you're comfortable in your corner, but every all the working people deserve equal opportunity and access to the benefits that this country offers. And that's also a huge part of what drives the engagement from the young people in our organization, because they also see like, wow, this community of people gets X, Y, and Z, and I might be good and I might be educated, but what about my family members that are coming here or people that may not be as highly educated? Should they suffer because they're not aware? No, we have to make sure that our people are aware of everything. You, you guys are the mouthpiece of that. Okay. What's cool, fresh and trendy with a new look? Makes you feel real good, that refreshing vibe. Satisfies you right just the way you like. Different, think special. This advertisement has been vetted and approved by the FDA.
All right. Um, Ajua, you mentioned something about, uh, you, you know, in 2017, uh, some good friends of mine, there were four of us, we wrote a paper that sought to decouple um, diaspora affairs from the diplomatic affairs. And you said something a minute ago that said the embassy represents the government of the country of Ghana. But what you guys are doing are more tilted towards the interests of Ghanaians uh, living in the diaspora. Do you believe that from a structural standpoint in Ghana, for example, when you have a ministry of diaspora, uh, ministry of foreign affairs, should we also have a ministry of Ghanaian diaspora that decouples the interest of the state from the interest of Ghanaians living abroad, especially considering that Ghanaians uh, in the diaspora bring in about $5 billion annually in remittances? The short answer is yes. Um, in fact, right now we are working on a bill, what we are deeming to call the diaspora bill to present to the Republic of Ghana. What we have seen is we know that the Republic of Ghana right now is working on a homeland return bill um, that is largely uh, designed to address the interests of diasporans, uh, um, particularly African-Americans, mm -hmm. in order to ease their pathways um, to Ghana. And what we have been uh, having discussions about at uh, two members of the Ghana government is that Ghanaians and the diaspora have specific unique needs. We also have a different pathway as either uh, children or grandchildren of Ghanaians, not to say about those who just immigrated here, mm -hmm. you are a Ghanaian. That is alone an education process that we have to engage in. And I give respect to those who have been doing that work all along in regards to ROPA. So what people don't understand is that we have a different pathway. That means we're never, we're not applying for dual citizenship. We have to process our dual citizenship. So that is one thing. Then we, are, we know what the research says, that in addition to the 5 billion you mentioned of financial remittances, Ghanaians in the diaspora are more likely to engage in social remittances, particularly those in the second and third generation. And so that means we're coming to Ghana, we're coming home to either do pro bono medical work and medical missions. Absolutely. We are um, become, sometimes doing pro bono education, right? Mm -hmm. and, and teaching in schools. Uh, we are engaged in slightly different ways. And so sometimes, I know you, I'm sure everyone knows, We've all experienced those challenges of when we try to go home, even when we're doing charitable work, um, to either get uh, the licensing, you know, or we're paying out of our nose um, to do basic things. And so what, we're, what we've been saying and what we hope to capture with this diaspora bill, of which we want to socialize with all the Ghanaian community leaders here in the United States uh, first, is that we have unique needs. And so there should be a budget and an office that can handle those unique needs. Not to say um, estate rights. How many of us have family members at home and when they pass, there's a whole issue with land and assets um, that you know is difficult for us um, living here or abroad. So, um, anyway, to say that, yes, we agree that there needs to be a ministry and the difference between an office and a ministry is that a ministry has a budget um, that can be allocated to address those issues. And I'll only wrap up to say that when I say that GHPAC is advocating for Ghanaians no matter where we live, I also mean Ghanaians at home because okay. we are just... We have the dual uh, responsibility, not only for our families and ourselves here or wherever we may live, but our families back at home. And we are all deeply entrenched with needs about development back at home. And so we believe in harnessing particularly private interests 
okay. uh, giving vehicles. And so we do policy work um, at home as well okay. to advance development. Very good. Now that leads me to the next big thing that you guys are working on, which I am so, so proud of you ladies. Um, Congressional Ghana Caucus. I mean, you hear a Congressional Black Caucus, Congressional, I didn't know there was specific country caucuses. What light can you share on them? Let me see, who, who, who wants to take this? I'll have Kim start off. Okay. Yeah, the Congressional Ghana Caucus is something, I mean, it's really like my baby. <laughs> and okay. The baby um, something that we're working hard to accomplish. But as you mentioned, there's a caucus for everything, single country caucuses, healthcare disease, childhood obese. There's a caucus for everything. And they're really a vehicle to drive policy, collaboration, to bring attention to issues. But all the caucuses aren't made equally. Some are more active than others. Some have just been established and you don't hear from them at all. But the Ghana caucus will be different. Um, one thing that has been very excited as we're working to launch the Congressional Ghana caucus is the level of interest that we've gotten from members of Congress. This is not something where we had to convince people or members of Congress rather why the Congressional Ghana caucus is important. It's more so, oh, there isn't one already? Oh, I've traveled to- <laughs> That was my- that... <laughs> You wow. would be- surprised how many um, elected officials have traveled to Ghana. They love it. Um, they're passionate about it. But again, this is why GHPAC is so important because for all of these years, the history of our country, the relationship that we have with the United States, there isn't, no one said, let's do this. And so we're doing it. And we're so excited that the caucus will be launched um, in September ahead of our gala. So it's very exciting. And we plan to have Hill briefings on issues. We're going to bring in speakers. We're going to be active. Um, we're going to put together congressional delegations um, for members of Congress to go visit and tour um, the country. And so it's, it's just very, very exciting. Again, the level of interest you think about in 2019, that Speaker Pelosi led a de delegation of members of Congress to Ghana. Do you know how special that is? I mean, you just heard about uh, Speaker Pelosi going to this country and, and all the news that it got, but she understands the history of Ghana and why it was important for her. Any member could can say, oh, they want to put together a CODEL and do that, but she, to have the Speaker of the United States, the most powerful woman come to, to do that, just speaks volumes. And so we're just excited that we're able to put this together. I'll also say it's more mm -hmm. than just the history, mm -hmm. the historic relationship between U.S. and Ghana that dates beyond 1957. We all know the story, mm -hmm. our former president Kwame Nkrumah coming to the United States and being educated here. We also have not heard the story of the fact that we have had Ghanaians who participated in the United States Civil Rights Movement. Mm -hmm. the regular Ghanaians who were college students who fought for voting rights um, and the like. But mm -hmm. that Ghana now it has stepped into a, a world role. Uh, we saw that earlier mm -hmm. this year with Ghana's vote at the, as the, at the UN Security Council, one of the few African votes we, we have seen that now as Ghana has been named as the seat and hub of the Secretariat for the Africa uh, Free Trade Agreement, mm -hmm. right? And now we're seeing that Ghana ha continues to be uh, very much appealing to U.S. companies and right now hosts 100 U.S. companies as their main headquarters in Africa. You know what? So, you know what? And, and this is coming to you and you can... Um, when when he first told me about this, what one of the things that stuck out of me is that rather than you trying to get to the Congress men and women to be a part of this, and I don't know if there is another country who has a caucus that you can compare it to, but in this case, it seemed like the the Congress men and women are literally fighting, uh, tripping over each other to be a part of this. Yes. 
<laughs> oh yes, oh yes, Be because it's it's going it's Congressional Ghana Caucus, but because Ghana is a leader, whoever is chairing the Congressional Ghana Caucus will essentially be the leader on U.S. Africa issues, bar none. Okay. And because they'll have the support of one of the most powerful, if I may, Ghanaian di uh, African diaspora organizations in the United States, GHPAC, of which because we have policy professionals at GHPAC and we can back them up with evidence, with research, and with community level support, which is critical now, um, just recently, the White House unveiled their new U.S. Africa strategy, and they realized that the only way the United States um, can compete as a global leader in Africa is to finally, finally tap into the African diaspora that lives in the United States. Because uh, I can say, at least for Ghana anyway, the largest Ghanaian diaspora lives in the United States. So as much as we um, love our 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 Brits are in it in it. <laughs> uh, we have to get organized. Uh, I, I beg, oh, I beg, oh, I beg. Don't start this fight on my show. I beg. <laughs> I mean, Ghana diaspora back will eventually uh, love con extend our work in other countries, including um, the UK and others, but. In fact, the UK, Ghanaians in the UK are more organized mm -hmm. than Ghanaians in the United States. And so that is why, so kudos to them on that one. But mm -hmm. here in the United <laughs> States, you know, it's, we have a larger geographic area. We're all spread from, we always talk about New York Ghanaians, DMV Ghanaians, but there's a strong Ghanaian community in LA, in Chicago, in Texas. And in don't forget, Canada. don't forget Toronto. Toronto is... <coughs> yeah. You have a Safu and all those things anyway. But yeah. I, this is all fine and dandy. I appreciate you guys. But at the end of the day, they said, bringing, you, you will understand this, bringing the bacon home. How does GH Pack and the Congressional Ghana Caucus bring home the bacon, Kim? You, see, you, see, you say it's your baby. I, I would say this, I mean, this is how it starts, right? Mm -hmm. You have to, I mean, it's a multi-step process. Mm -hmm. um, and that's why the stakeholder engagement piece that I spoke about earlier is so critical. Mm -hmm. Yeah, people might often think, oh, to do business with Europe, to do business with China. More recently, the U.S. Chamber of Commerce just um, published an article that speaks about the importance of doing business in Africa and having that relationship. They're actually going on a um, like a speaker series event across the country. I think it begins um, early September in Atlanta to talk to businesses about, hey, we need to pay attention to Africa, but for us it's pay attention to Ghana. Um, and these are the reasons why. And so it's, it's like, you know, people will think, oh, Africa, Ghana, third world country, right? People who really don't know what the options and opportunities um, exist there, but it's education, right? And through this caucus, we'll be able to educate business leaders about the possibility of trade, business opportunities in the country. And so the education piece is important um, and making sure that we're connecting individuals who want to do work and contribute and be a part of um, business opportunities in Ghana. So I think that's a huge piece of it. And that's what we're working um, to accomplish. You know, we think about Africa, Ghana, youngest population, all the opportunities there from infrastructure, technology, there's so much that can be done. But if people aren't aware, you know, they won't know that it's an option. And you think about social media, and how that has really impacted young people and their interest and in even traveling to Ghana. I mean, I think about my friends growing up like, oh, Kim, you're from Ghana. Okay, nice. Now those same friends are like, oh, Kim, can you introduce me to a cousin? Because I'm going to spend my holidays in Ghana and I want to go to this place and this place. So if you think about that interest and the way social media has even helped change the perception of what Africa is, what Ghana is, that people, young people who may have made jokes about 
Africa decades ago are the same ones that want to travel there. It's similarly aligned with yeah. um, the community and realizing how much potential there is um, to work together and uh, economic. I draw, I draw, yeah. It looks like Kim, I, I asked for bacon and she just gave me a coupon to go to the grocery store. Give me the bacon. <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> well, OK. Well, two prong, two, two things additional to add to what Kim said mm -hmm. is that um, one, we want to make sure that Ghanaians who often spend, as you've mentioned, a lot of money either building or starting businesses or projects in Ghana. Uh, if you're living in the United States, you have access to U.S. government resources to fund your programs and projects and businesses. And oftentimes we do not know that. And yet the U.S. government is funding projects in Ghana and we're not at the table. Usually those projects are led by people that don't look like us, don't have mm -hmm. Kwame, Kojo, Akuya names. And that is unfortunate. It does. It, it shouldn't be that you have to put on a kente dance or a fish fry or something like this to raise funds for your project. When the U.S. government will fund um, hundreds and thousands of dollars for hospitals, for um, clinics. Many of us are involved with, you know, all kinds of projects in Ghana. So number one is going around to the Ghanaian community in the United States and doing master classes of which uh, we are sharing with them what are the resources that they can tap to, into at the federal level, as well as state and local as well. And which is why in September, we are embarking on our sister city trade series events as well to give those opportunities and uh, business business to business matching and linkages um, in various industries where of interest between US and Ghana, that is one. The other is, as Kim mentioned, in regards to appealing to uh, companies, US companies that have an interest in Ghana, is to make sure that whatever projects they are embarking on actually create jobs for Ghanaians at home. Okay. Actually serve the interests of Ghanaians at home. It is important for us that we are a bit of a watchdog in that way, as well as um, maybe provide the intelligence on the ground, the market research on the ground of where to invest. So uh, when we talk about bringing companies to Ghana to do tours, um, often of potential projects that they can invest in. It is for that design and goal that it actually helps and advances development in those areas as well. Okay. Cool, fresh and trendy with a new look Makes you feel real good and fresh and right Satisfies you right just the way you like Feel different. Think special. This advertisement has been vetted and approved by the FDA. Well, Kim, let me get back to you about the way forward. And before I do that, I just want to, uh, you guys to clear up something. Um, typically, when we Africans mostly are in America and we want to do anything like you guys doing, dealing directly with um, uh, Capitol Hill and Washington and everything, um, we tend to gravitate towards the Democratic Party. Uh, but we also know the reality is that in this country, uh, the bus sometimes turns left a little bit and then turns right and then turns left because that's the only way you go forward. At some point, you turn left. At some point, you turn right. And so is what you're doing going to be possible if you align with one particular political party? Oh, I mean, I 
you're you're absolutely right. Business, stakeholder engagement, you can't be partisan. You have to be able to work with members on both sides of the aisle if you really want to um, get things accomplished. And so the Congressional Ghana Caucus will be bipartisan. You will have elected officials that are Democrats and Republicans because you wanna work with people who understand the importance of Africa, the opportunity, why the U.S.-Ghana relationship is very important. So, I mean, simply to answer, yes, <laughs> it's not a, oh, this is a Democrat-focused um, organization. No, you have to be able to be successful as a lobbyist, period. You have to be able to navigate and work with both. And okay. she's talking about the lobbying side. But remember, mm -hmm. we also have our PAC. So... So that means that we do support candidates on both sides of the aisle as well if they effectively demonstrate that either they're, they're going to put forth policies that protect the interests of Ghanaians living in the United States, or if they themselves being Ghanaian running for elective office, whether they're Republican or Democrat, have shown that they are going to put forth policies that, that we as yeah, a community yeah. care about. We don't just endorse any Ghanaian that's running for elected office. We really do um, ask them to interview with us. Sometimes, depending on the area, if it's an area that has a lot of Ghanaians, we will ask them to present themselves to the Ghanaian community in which they will then uh, participate in the poll to advise us, GHPAC, on whether or not we should endorse that candidate as well. In our fourth republic, um, President Clinton, went to Ghana when President Rawlins was the president there. And then President Bush went to Ghana when uh, President Ejekum was the president there. And then President um, Obama went to Ghana when Mills and then Mahama. Uh, Trump did not go to Africa. Now, but it's hard to argue against some of my friends in Ghana who make the Republican argument that, look, when you look at beginning the Fourth Republic, Clinton, you can't put a finger on what he did that directly benefited us. Yes, he was party to the Agua uh, legislation. And uh, today's day, I haven't really seen anything concrete out of it. But Bush, on the other hand, with this Millennium Challenge uh, uh, account thing, we saw concrete stuff that came to Ghana and Africa. With um, Obama, again, when you ask Obama what he did in, in Africa, they point to Libya. All Obama did was take out uh, Gaddafi in Libya. And so the Republicans are winning that argument in Africa. What can you say to shed light on so that we get a total picture since you guys are working on United States Congress? I'll take this one. Um, so the Republicans you've described are unfortunately the Republicans of old to a large extent across the party. And that has nothing to do with Africa itself or Ghana in particular. Uh, what Trump introduced is America first, an isolationist uh, policy and point of view, meaning that um, there was a limited interest in an international affairs period, not just Africa, unless it was directly about um, military intervention. And even that was limited. Um, so, so even with our Congressional Ghana Caucus, uh, when we are looking at who we can engage on the Republican side, to be frank, there was just very few that um, we can't, we know that are right now directly involved with international affairs, or particularly Africa affairs, in the same way that you described as, as Bush and others in the past. We hope that that changes in the future. Um, what we uh, do know that is that there are Republicans, um, whether, again, I mentioned in other levels of government, um, that um, really are focused on uh, competing with China um, and trade and investment on the continent. And that is where we're finding opportunities to engage as well. Also, when you've described the Democrats and their approach to Africa, it had been primarily about aid. Mm -hmm. So that is to not diminish what has happened uh, under those presidents. 
uh, large amounts of aid uh, allocated to Africa and to Ghana. Um, as much as we talk about our progress and things of that nature, we still do receive a lot of aid, even just recently with this COVID pandemic and um, access to vaccines uh, because of uh, aid from the United States government. Okay. But what we're seeing now with Democrats, uh, Democrats is there a, a bit of an awakening, albeit maybe late, that um, aid can be the only way to engage um, with Africa. And so what we are anticipating is a, a realignment after AGOA, which is set to expire in 2025, um, towards more of a bilateral, uh, mutually beneficial arrangement of trade and investment. And we're already seeing glimpses of that with Biden's Build Back Better World initiative, of which we are, our GHPAC is in strong support of, uh, which is all about investing in infrastructure projects um, in emerging countries like Ghana. We know that they are very much interested in um, financing projects in Ghana right now, and we are uh, advocating for projects to be considered on the Build Back Better World. Also, Prosper Africa, a huge program at the U.S. government right now, is something that Ghanaians living in the United States should pay close attention to because even if you have a small and medium enterprise, you can get funding from Prosper Africa um, to carry forward. So for example, I believe her, um, uh, Rahama Wright to Shea Butter is a project of Prosper Africa, for example. Please, and please so, write DNT's name down for that. For that. Uh, <laughs> so yeah, so it, it, but you have to get, you have to play. You can't yeah. say that because this is a democratic president or I don't like something yeah. or another, and then I'm not going to engage in what is available and right. things of that, or educate myself. Mm -hmm. Okay. So what's the way forward, Kim? The way forward, is, I think, is exactly what we're doing. Getting this caucus off the ground, which is going to happen in September, continuing to educate members of Congress about the importance of U.S.-Ghana relation, relationships, um, in ensuring that our community is actively engaged. You know, we have an upcoming election. Um, we want our people to be out there and vote in numbers. And that's also impactful when these elected officials who are running in tough races know that they have a constituency that they can count on. They will in turn be more supportive. And so, um, you know, there's just a number of things that's multi-layered um, that has to be done to make sure that we are effective. Again, we don't want to be a congressional caucus, just a name. We don't want to be an organization, just a name. We want to be active. And so there's so many different functions of, of our organization, community engagement, economic, business, um, parts of GHPAC, the political side of things. And we're all working in tandem to advance um, Ghanaians across the diaspora and to make sure that we're able to prosper in this Good. country. So who are some of the names of uh, congressional uh, uh, members um, who want to be a part of this uh, Congressional Ghana Caucus? So for the co-chairs, we have Congressman Dwight Evans um, out of Pennsylvania, Philly, uh, Sheila Jackson Lee, from Texas and that, that's that's my girl. If she wasn't part of it, I would have serious questions for her. Go ahead. So then you have other members. You think about um, Congresswoman Terry Sewell. We've had conversations with Chairman Meeks, Gregory Meeks. He chairs the House Foreign Affairs, and he's been very supportive. He actually during the pandemic um, was a keynote speaker um, during one of our events, um, and so it's. Yeah. And we, we like, must like, mention Congress. Wait, we must mention Congresswoman Gwen Moore. Gwen Moore. Oh, um, oh wow, that's yeah. a number of them. But my question is, since uh, I noticed that, who, which of you it, was it? Kim that said you worked in the Senate uh, before? Or, I interned. I interned for Senator Cardin of Maryland. He's the okay. senior senator when he served on the Senate Judiciary Committee, and okay. I worked on my the House side. Is, uh, what role do senators get to play with, or is it just limited to the House? So so this eventually will be a bicameral caucus, which means okay. it will be House and Senate. Okay. It usually, because of the, it, the, the 
the organization on the role of a House of Representatives, meaning that it's supposed to reflect mm -hmm. the interests of the constituents in a more visceral way than the Senate does, right? Most caucuses begin on the House side yeah. okay. um, and then eventually uh, go to the Senate side. But we, we are even, we're here in Martha's Vineyard because um, I was coming this, to uh, that. I was coming yes. to that. What's happening in Martha's Vineyard? I mean, come on, you guys are having all the fun in a hotel in <laughs> Martha's Vineyard and what's going on? Well, so I said how hard work lobbying is, but this is part of it too, is uh, <laughs> coming to nice places like Martha Vineyard where um, this weekend um, it's uh, events hosted by uh, several actually members of Congress that are here galvanized to commiserate. Um, and we were here just now pitching up and what will be a very f incoming future Senator about that when she should sign on now, um, as, as she's a member of the House of Representatives, and when she becomes a senator, then she can carry forward and chair. Are the we caucus. talking about Val Demings? No, I wish. <laughs> no, we, I mean, we we're going after her too, but we were talking about a Congresswoman Lisa Blount Rochester of Delaware, yeah. where there's a lot of Ghanaians in Delaware. Oh, okay. And, and he, she's running for a Senate from the Delaware side? She's not running. Um, the, there isn't a vacant seat, but she is if, next oh, in positioning line. herself. Yeah, she's she's next in line, <laughs> and she's someone that's loved, you know, across the board. She's an excellent and active member of Congress, and so we had a great conversation with her today. And I'll also highlight uh, Congressman Jonah Goose from Colorado, um, our East African brother, who is when I mentioned it to him. Oh. Count me in. No, you don't even have to explain. And so what that's about, the what about Omar from Minnesota? So you know we are we are approaching her soon about the Ghana caucus. We know that she's already head of several caucuses, including I believe the Somalian caucus. Okay. So sometimes we have to be careful about uh, not picking those that are overloaded. Uh, yeah. But we know she has a, a growing interest generally in leading. So the Africa portfolio at the United States Congress, we are in discussions. Finally, when are y'all going to run for Congress? <laughs> I'm going to look at her. I'm going to look at her. Um, <laughs> I don't see running for elected office in my future. I love the work that I'm doing, but I will always support candidates um you know i think who i think well would be it looks like it looks like you just threw the ball to ajua ajua when is your <laughs> candidacy <laughs> announcement uh having worked for a u.s congresswoman and uh, for a number of years um shout out to congresswoman jan Schakowsky, uh who you know never took her shoes off and walked th those marble floors all day long <laughs> i said you know i think i would rather uh work behind the scenes <laughs> yeah. We enjoy being king makers. Um, I will say at GH Pack, there's nothing wrong with that. All right. What do you need from the authorities in Ghana about your efforts? <clears throat> Support. Um it, it is time, you know, for for you know, just in the way that Israel has APAC, that Ghana has GH Pack. And that this is going to only um, elevate the country, elevate Ghanaians, help them in their roles, in what they're trying to achieve to do, make them smarter in what they're trying to do, um, even perhaps get them some staff that uh, look at politics and policy in a different way. I will say that you know we've been exposed to politics and policy in a slightly different way, having been here in the United States. Um, and it's always good to share those ideas. And we've already been, already been doing that with those politicos in Ghana as well. And so we think that's all for the advancement and development of our, of our lovely home, Ghana. The time is now. Kim Hafuokwa, a George from my team, thank you for speaking with DNT. And more grease to your elbows. Well, thank you for your platform. You're one of the reasons that GHPAC exists and that we really are about elevating Ghanaians and the diaspora and that, you know, we are here. We are already sort of at the table. Now we must organize and 
and work collectively at uh, Mr. Nkuma, the diaspora network at television is one of those examples. And so we really appreciate all the work that you do to spread light and awareness on what diasporans are doing and all the issues impacting Ghanaians at home as well. Thank you so much.